It's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here in Korea. Again, uh, it was about 18 months ago that I was uh, first invited uh, to Korea to give a little bit of historical background on uh, blockchain and some of my work and, uh, uh, that predated blockchain. I was not in this space at that time. And it was such a kind invitation and I, I learned at this event that blockchain wasn't really uh, technically as sound as it could be and I heard a lot of discussion about plans for the future and things that people were working on and and so on, and uh, frankly, I was unimpressed. I, I, I concluded that the, the types of fundamental improvements that are needed, like consumer scale and quantum resistance and privacy uh, and so forth, and mass adoption, were not just a matter of uh, engineering, but rather that they required some fundamental new technical breakthroughs, scientific breakthroughs. And so I started working on that and uh, that's why I'm here now to present what I think is a uh, very fundamental breakthrough in this space. We call it Praxis and it is a new, fundamentally new type of consensus algorithm and a new currency that's based on it. And, you know, I've been working in this space for like 40 years trying to provide privacy the way it was, uh, the issues were framed back in the day and understand the fundamental capability of, of cryptography uh, to provide security and privacy. And I've worked on voting systems and, you know, I probably many of you have heard of the DigiCash work and, in the 90s, uh, and probably most of you don't know that in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, the Byzantine guy, Leslie Lamport, and I were hanging out in Berkeley talking about all this stuff before the famous results were published, and my dissertation at Berkeley, my PhD thesis, was on a way to do distributed consensus, essentially a blockchain, and people have now recently written about that. If you look at my Wikipedia page, you can read about the uh, reference where essentially it's, it's asserted that all the elements of modern blockchains, whether permissioned or unpermissioned, were in my, my dissertation. But because I was such a privacy fanatic and digital sovereignty believer, I didn't sign away the rights to my thesis. So that meant that it was never published electronically and it just remained on paper in the library at Berkeley. So most people are unaware of my early work in, in consensus, but I've, I've been using uh, this background and a lot of other things that I've worked on over the years to come up with this uh, Praxis uh, scheme. It's, it's, it's a the first really strong quantum resistant electronic payment system, but it also includes the speed, privacy, and scalability needed to be uh, mass adopted. And, and I'll come back to uh, these, these points uh, in more detail. This is not working. Oh, it's working, but with delay. Um, switch to this one. So we have created a crash project of some of the top, top people that I could pull together from all over the world to work on developing this breakthrough 
at a special lab we've created in the Cayman Islands where it doesn't have any restriction on who can come there uh, and work. That's a view from one of our windows. It's not a really bad place to work and we've uh, been uh, uh, at it for a while now and in a stealth mode and I, here I'm announcing the fact that that we're actually doing this and, and we now see how this is all coming together and we we're expecting uh, a white paper hopefully before the end of this calendar year. And so, of course, the underlying vision is that articulated in the first words of the Satoshi white paper to make an electronic money that can be used widely by everybody and that's something that still remained uh, a bit elusive. And now, just I think yesterday or so, the, even the National Academy of Sciences in the US has said that they're concerned that quantum computers may break crypto cryptographic systems. And they don't know exactly when. But, I mean, just like you know, engineering work in software isn't going to make fundamental advances. You can also say, I think safely, that, like they used to say when I was growing up, you know, they used to say the, the revolution will not be televised. Do you remember that? This was a meaningful statement to us in those days. Well, I don't think the development of quantum cryptanalysis will be something that you'll learn about in advance. You'll only find out after currencies that are based on it have been totally destroyed. Because the, the, the actors that are capable of, of developing these technologies are, are state actors. It's not, uh, so, and there's more evidence of this. You saw recently a announcement of progress in this space was taken down on a U.S. government uh, site. This is, um, so there's a there's a there's a battle on for dominance in this and and breakthroughs in this technology, and it it's it's a serious threat to cryptocurrencies. So the Praxis currency is able to provide the, the kind of scale and speed that's needed for consumer transactions. As I've said in, in past uh, announcements on, uh, related to our technology, generally you can do tens of thousands of transactions a second, which is way more than like the Visa network, uh, even when it's running out, out of both of its redundant data centers, and allegedly that accounts for something like 40% of global, global payments. So, the fundamental idea of our payment technology is one of a denominated currency. In other words, just like the original eCash from the 90s, it is based on numbers that are each worth fixed amounts of money, just like containerized shipping, just like paper money and metal coins. Each different type of signature validates a number to be worth a f fixed amount. And this is a, say, currently a relatively unique approach, even though it's well proven out in the 90s with, with eCash. But what it, it does is it gives you a piece of the privacy puzzle. It gives you what might be called horizontal privacy. It starts to break the linking between transactions and tr other transactions. Now when you combine this with the Elixir, which is our other uh, technology, uh, uh, mixing, which breaks the link between the individual's physical location or identity and the transactions, the vertical link, then you have unprecedented privacy and payments. So Praxis 
provides the underlying type of ingredient that's necessary to be fully private when it's integrated with Elixir. So, you know, I think that the, the fundamental interest in the blockchain space is probably triggered by, let's say, governmental usurpation of people's money. And there are a lot of places around the world where governments have devalued or basically confiscated money from consumers and this, to a large extent, it could, you could uh, interpret as explaining why there's so much interest in digital money that is outside of the control of governments. But I think now the world is, is rapidly changing because of awareness of another kind of thing that governments and the like are taking from us, and that is all the information about us. They are they, taking our privacy away. You could say it's a, a theft of metadata. The public is, in many countries, outraged, and there is tremendous, uh, let's say, uh, hatred towards those social media companies and the like, the technical, technological behemoths of this world for having secretly stolen what it is that's essential and unique about us all. But moreover, and, and far more frightening really, is the apparent ease with which this information can be used to not only manipulate our political orientation and our votes, so it's actually being used to take control of society. And that is, is a far worse threat than someone stealing your money because basically what that means is they're stealing your freedom and your ability to, to, to be a human being. It's a very, very serious escalation. And so what's needed now urgently to address this issue is protection of what is referred to as metadata. Metadata was defined recently by Edward Snowden, you know, you may think he broke the law, you may think he's a hero, or both. Uh, it doesn't really matter. He was in a unique position to know, so this statement is, is still quite valid, independent of what you might think about Edward Snowden. He's telling us that, and I'll, maybe I'll just pause to let the translators translate this. But as we know, the United States government, together with its, uh, its uh, friends, have been engaged in what Edward Snowden told us initially was, is called internally the full take. Have you heard that expression, the full take? That's, that's spy talk for capturing every single bit that, that travels over every single wire in the world and saving it forever. And that data, even if the message content is encrypted, the remainder of that data is what's called metadata and it is actually more revealing and much more easily distilled and much more certain to be un alterable and, and, and un, uh, uh, to be true. That's all the so-called traffic analysis, all the who talks to whom and when, 
the so-called social graph, where you are at each moment, wh who you're communicating with, what, what organizations, what sort of transactions, how long the transactions are, how long they last, et cetera, et cetera. The whole pattern of your life and uh, recently, I mean, just to illustrate this, a fellow at MIT did a little bit of analysis just based on his email to sort of see what kind of a picture of his life would be revealed. And he, he's written about this. And uh, this does not include all the other location-based tracking, everything else that has now become quite prevalent. So people have written about how this kind of thing is done, it's not rocket science, it's a, it's a technological engineering process that's extraordinarily well funded, has complete access to everything it needs to do, and it's just a very organized routine process that just scoops up, analyzes, sorts, saves, and then makes available to anyone in governments that wants it, all this data. So this is, this, you know, your tax dollars at work, as we say. Well, okay, when Silvio and I were uh, back uh, having fun at, in Berkeley, you know, in graduate school, studying computer science, um, solving the really hard problems, which was like a huge thrill, I gotta tell you, when, uh, uh, I was also thinking about what this stuff meant for the world. And I wrote this in an article which later uh, appeared in Scientific American. So that was like translated into 10 languages. It's appeared on the, featured on, on the cover also of the, like the top journal of computer science at the time, communication of the ACM and so forth and so on. It was pretty widely reported well, maybe I'll just let this be translated. If... So, was, you know, I urge you to, if you have time, go back and look at this original article. You'll see that it also predicted and had an illustration of a smartphone and predicted the importance of electronic commerce and so forth. But what it really was mainly trying to set up is this big problem which I think we are only seeing the very beginning of now. There's going to be an escalation of measures and countermeasures in this battle to control what I think is the whole game. Control over our informational lives. That is the whole game. So uh, I'd like to now show you just a, 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 a video that explains the solution. Uh, we, we need the audio. Can we get the audio for this? Uh... When the metadata. Okay, let, let me just start it again. So here's a, a brief two minute cartoon video with Korean subtitles that I narrate, which explains how the uh, Elixir and Praxis uh, technologies team up to shred metadata and provide a platform that can solve this very urgent and pressing problem. Suppose Alice wants to send a message to Bob, but she doesn't want anyone to know that the two of them are communicating. Message content can easily be protected by so-called end-to-end encryption, but this does not protect the information about who is talking to whom and when. The metadata, which is increasingly recognized as far more revealing and more challenging to protect. 
each member of a team of nodes in order to protect the metadata successively shuffles the batch of encrypted messages using its container of secretly arranged tubes and sending the messages without delay through to the next team member. Even just a single node can keep senders from being linked to recipients. Alice also gets a receipt informing her confidentially that her message was provided to Bob. Team members then destroy their secret pattern of tubes, making way for a new team ready for a new batch. Earlier, each node is chosen independently as a kind of random secret key, which input tube to connect to which output tube. Elixir's breakthrough over the type of messaging I open sourced in the 80s is a way that enables almost all the work to be done well in advance, yielding the only known way to provide real-time metadata protection smartphone to smartphone. Lead can also pay you me by sending what appears to be an ordinary message, but that actually contains numbers that serve like metal coins and paper money. A called such denominated unforgeable numbers digital cash first issued by DigiCash in the 90s. Elixir's breakthrough improvement on the original digital cache now makes it fully distributed and quantum resistant. Elixir thus is able to uniquely provide a new, ultimate metadata level protection of confidentiality in all your online communications and payments. For the first time, giving you a protected sphere protecting your digital world today and your digital future. Okay, you can uh, see that up on our Elixir uh, website. So, after announcing, uh, actually it was just a year ago that, that I would start this uh, company and, and uh, actually build this stuff, we've uh, made a lot of progress and spent a lot of time traveling around and, uh, you know, interacting with the community, it's very important, and building a, a, a super team. I mean, by the way, we're the only development team in the Cayman Islands, as far as I can tell, in this space. Seems to be one of the only places you can bring people from anywhere in the world to work on a common project. So um, uh, I think we're doing something extraordinary in that regard. Now we have a transparent process that's, I think, uniquely transparent, where we first had a survey to find out what was wanted and a completely open process with dispute resolution and so on to arrive at a set of volunteer node operators for our beta network, and this is now completed for a while, and we have three teams of beta node operators, and uh, we're very pleased by the showing of support that that represents. We also have, well, the numbers in increased since this slide was made, but we have several thousand people who are using our waiting list app and are looking forward to participating in our uh, messaging system. And the messaging system is running, it's live on nodes that are operated by our alpha partners. These are uh, companies that are interested in running these nodes and helping us measure and evaluate everything and have access to the full APIs and the libraries that allow them complete access to the messaging platform. And uh, that's also uh, running very well currently. And today, represents an important announcement of practice coming out of stealth here, at least here in Asia, and uh, a little more in-depth discussion of, of the quantum resistance. So we've, uh, I think, in a, in a short span of a year since we announced our, the beginning of our efforts, uh, we've achieved a, a great deal with uh, a lot of help, and uh, so for which I'm grateful. Um, And as you know, it's all about community in this space. And so our XX Collective, sort of unifying Praxis and Elixir, is underway. We have uh, one 
thing that the, the collective's helping with is the performance analysis of, of the Alphanet. And there are, um, you know, public, involved in public verification of the whole system. And they're using the, the Android and iOS uh, clients currently. And I guess you can see some of that scrolling by there. And importantly, the collective is grateful to when the leadership that our uh, local leaders uh, provide and we are currently uh, open to establishing relationships with uh, additional local leaders. And this, this, of course, as you, many of you know, is proved to be an important part of most community development uh, and most uh, programs, and so uh, we would encourage anyone that's interested in participating in this to uh, reach out to us. And I just wanted to kind of wrap up here by pointing out that we'll be having a few events, and in particular today, just as this conference closes, if you walk past the escalator on this floor, you will come to the Rose Room and that's where we will be holding a, a meetup at, at seven or when the conference is over. And we have uh, other meetups uh, here and in, uh, then we'll be uh, in, in Japan and, and uh, also for DEF CON and so on. So, Looking forward to uh, having a chance to discuss any and all of this and meet you in person at, at some of our uh, events. And so I'd like to, yeah, thank you all for your, uh, for your interest and attention and support. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks, David. All right.